So once again, welcome everyone to the VLS Collection Open House. Um, this is our last session for the week. My name is Rama Kava Damanin, Program Lead for the Open Library at eCampus Ontario. And I'm Rich Lutet. I'm the uh, Open Library and Micro-Credential uh, Program Manager at eCampus Ontario. And Rama and I are co-hosting our final event for the week. Okay. Thank you for that introduction. So before we get started with our last um, uh, sessions, I just want to start us off with a land acknowledgement. Um, so eCampus Ontario's offices in downtown Toronto are located on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis. We join you today from Burlington and Toronto, Ontario, which is situated on the same territories. Burlington is also mutually covered by the Dish for One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant. I recognize, we recognize and we are grateful for the legacy of all the past, present and future generations of the first peoples of this land. So I encourage and invite you to share your own land acknowledgement in the chat. Um, one of my colleagues will drop the uh, link in the chat where you can find your land acknowledgement if you're not sure. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen and then that way I can introduce our first uh, presenters. Moment. Okay. One moment, there we go. Okay, so we would like to thank the Ontario Ministry of Colleges and Universities for their investment in the virtual learning strategy. The VLS derives growth and advancement in virtual learning across the province's post-secondary institutions. Uh, we will drop the link in the in, we will drop the link to the chat um, uh, to learn more about the VLS project. So our first presenter uh, presentation, What's Wrong with Simon? An Interprofessional Pediatric Virtual Gaming Simulation Using 360 Video Lesson Learn is presented by Wendy, pr pronouns she and her um, academic director, and Paula, pronouns she and her special project manager from George Brown College's Sally's Horse for Eaton, uh, Eaton School of Nursing. So let's see. So I believe my colleagues is giving, there, there they are. Now I can see, just gotta expand my screen. So welcome Wendy and Paula. So I will go ahead and, and you know, just stay in the background and over to you. Feel free to share um, any uh, presentation that you have. Fantastic, thank you. Well, my colleague is setting up the presentation and putting it in presentation mode, Paula. That would be great. Um, I want to say thank you so much for this opportunity for us to come and speak about this uh, really exciting project. Uh, we'll, we'll jump right into it uh, very shortly. And Paula, you are sharing the presenter slides just so you know, so you may want to just reverse the, um, the view there. Thank you. Thank you for your patience, everyone. I hope you're having a fabulous day. It looks like the weather is getting much nicer out. I'm really thrilled to see the spring and the summer myself. I'm sure many of you are as well. Yes, oh, you're in Montreal, how nice. Hi, Tim. Thank you so much for sharing that. I haven't been to Montreal in a very long time. So, Wendy, are, sorry, are you seeing the, the presentation in presentation mode at the moment? Yes, perfect. It's excellent. Okay, okay. great. Good to go Thanks. Then. Okay, we're good to go. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Wendy Ellis. I'm an academic director, as we were introduced uh, at School of Nursing at George Brown College, and my my co-partner, my, my colleague is Paula Mistrilli, and she is also in a position of special projects and manager of those special projects at George Brown College. We are going to walk you through the opportunity that we had with eCampus Ontario to develop this virtual gaming simulation titled, What is Wrong with Simon? An Interprofessional Pediatric Virtual Gaming Simulation. So next slide, please, Paula. 
Thank you. Now, I know that we were um, privileged enough to be able to give the land acknowledgement. We again will also recognize that we are all gathering on the Indigenous people's land and we are so lucky as treaty people to live and, and work on this land. So this slide here indicates um, the core VGS or virtual gaming simulation team that was pulled together that represents professionals from across disciplines, industry partners, and key content experts. And without the funding from eCampus Ontario, we are just thrilled that we were able to receive those funds for us to move forward as an interprofessional team to create this very innovative pediatric focused virtual gaming simulation. Again, as you can see, we had representations from Sick Children's Hospital or Sick Kids, the Missioner Institute and Affinity Learning, among other um, organizations in partnership also with Fleming College and Simulation Canada. Thank you, Paula. Next slide. So what are you going to get from this session? Our objectives are as follows. You will begin to understand the benefits of an extensive consultation process as you're developing a virtual gaming simulation, preview the elements of our VGS, gain insights into lessons learned during the VGS 360 degree development process because our project really did integrate 360 video and photographs within the virtual gaming experience, and deepen your understanding of the development process through the discussion that we will have at the end. So I encourage you, we do have a few minutes for comments and questions. So we look forward to engaging you in that process. Next slide, please. So what did we set out to do? Well, our key goal was really to have an extensive and immersive opportunity for learners. And from the literature and from our past experience, we know that avatar and video-based virtual simulations are absolutely growing in popularity. The pandemic actually accelerated that opportunity and they're fully integrated or being close to integrated in most healthcare programs or educational programs across disciplines. Now, virtual gaming simulations usually consist of video-based or branching scenarios and really embedded in what we call a serious game design. So it's very purposeful, very structured, and again, grounded in evidences, and we're starting to see more and more literature to support its use. And they're very effective to help learners problem solve and really be immersed in those experiences for critical thinking and real true to life experiences. As I mentioned, and what we represented in the one slide around the core membership of the team, is that this was unique in that it truly was an interprofessional collaborative experience right from design, development, production, and post-production. And the integration of 360 degree photographs and videos is what really makes this what we're aiming to achieve anyway and what some of our results demonstrate, a very immersive experience for learners across the healthcare disciplines. The focus was again on pediatric and a deteriorating pediatric scenario. So at this point of the presentation, I'm going to turn it over to Paula and Paula will walk us through and uh, you know enjoy the show and, um, and see what we came up with. So Paula, over to you. Thanks, Wendy. Um, so we are going to show you snippets from, from the actual um, virtual gaming simulation uh, so that you can see how we incorporate the techniques that we 360 techniques, the, the video techniques that will in, in pull the students in. Now, hold across everybody cross their fingers that I'm going to share the right page here. Okay, with audio. Okay, show's starting. <laughs> Can see it, Wendy? Yeah, excellent. We're good to okay. Um, so, and you may want to expand it in the upper uh, right. Yep. Your there we go. Great. Okay, so here is um, it is the Simon video it is a pediatric acute care situation, and as you can see from the very first uh, slide, we've used 360 photo photography to familiarize the student with an ER room because not all students in different professions get a chance to go into an ER room. This strategy could be used with anything. So there are hot spots everywhere and they're encouraged to explore uh, thermometer. So just about everything here can be clicked in one way or another to tell them what they will normally find in a room like this. So this is the uh, PPE setup outside the room. And you can actually go all the way around. So that's one way we did it. 
once the student has explored, there is um, a video with an interaction with the, with the player or what we, the healthcare provider who is caring for this family. And based on that video, we then put a photograph up saying, we want them to get their situational awareness. What did they notice in that video that would be priorities of concern? And uh, they are asked to find those three. So in one case, this child is tripoding. It's his posture that gives it away. Uh, he, he speaks and you'll hear- Simon, are you gonna look at my knee? It got smushed. I'm the bat catcher. Right, so you can see he's speaking in short phrases, which is another telltale sign. And he also has something called a tracheal tug. So these three things in the video they previously watched, we're hoping that they will identify and then they can move on in the game. Um, this scenario shows you the nurse in a very realistic situation where she's trying to assess him. And as normal, when you've got your stethoscope, the uh, person is speaking, the mother and the child are speaking, so she can't quite hear and then it clears up at the end. So, and you'll see this is one of the decision points and one of the student, one of our focus groups told us this is a common error that students or learners make. And I'll, I'll correct myself, it was not a nurse. The, the player is not identified. They could be in any pro health professional group. Breathless uh, after a game, it's just his asthma. That's why I'm bat catcher. Don't have to run around so much. Oh, it's okay, just breathe naturally. Sorry, did, did you say he has a history of asthma? Yes, but it's not serious. Why, what is it? What are you hearing? I'm not sure. So as soon as the video clips end, they're asked to um, identify what their best next step is based on what they've heard. And in this case, she's not sure. So again, that common error is students don't ask for assistance when they should be asking. So uh, the correct answer would be this, which would move them to the next scenario. And that the team leader comes in, she's called in and is there to help. Now, at this point in the video, the, 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 the game, the child has become um, much more short of breath and all of his vital signs as on the monitor, which had been put on him, are, are exasperating. So in this clip, you're going to see how we really try to draw the players in to the urgency of a realistic um, a, a deteriorating pediatric client. So that's the feedback. He needs oxygen. Apply oxygen, right? Yes. Uh, this one? Mm -hmm. What rate? Uh, two liters. Or should it be four? Four liters per minute. The student has put it on incorrectly, which is also a common thing that happens. And the team leader has is correcting. There we go. Okay, so that that is the illustrations we have for you now. We might have time for a few more later, but. Uh, I will go back to the PowerPoint. And we will go back to the presentation mode. Wendy, is that visible correctly? Okay. So um, one of the things that we have done, and, and we've created almost a dozen of these uh, in collaboration with various partners, uh, is that the consultation process is really critical this, to this process of creating virtual simulations. Can't emphasize that enough. In this particular scenario, we actually use the focus groups to help us create the scenario, but also to refine the scenario. So we had faculty with pediatric backgrounds come in and who were aware of what curriculum they're teaching related to pediatric care and urgent care. Well, we had subject matter experts from sick kids attend. We had students who had had some kind of an acute pediatric experience 
be part of our focus groups. And we even were able with Sick Kids Help to get families who uh, had had children in these types of situations. Uh, based on their feedback, we were able to create the story. And then we even went back and checked the story with them before we finished it. Uh, and then usability testing is also before you release a game like this on the public, you really do need to ensure that the there are no glitches in the system. Now, our usability was basically phase one. We were able to attract um, about 26 members in total. We had them go through the game, a portion of them go through the game. Uh, normally, we would bring them into a studio, put them in front of a computer screen and take notes while they're playing the game and ask them to think out loud anything they're thinking. That way we can discover if they're confused about the buttons, if there are glitches in the game, and then we make revisions based on that feedback. With COVID times, we were able to actually do this online where they shared their screen while they played and we were listening on the other side and making our notes. Uh, and it was very useful because we could even record their play and therefore share it with our technologists around where, where we were having problems. Uh, we made changes and then we brought in those 26 students in total. 21 of them actually participated in this part. They played the game on their own asynchronously, and then they completed a survey. The survey is, has a validity and reliability. It's called the user experiences with online games. And uh, they gave us on a five point Likert scale on the, on the different um, questions, we averaged somewhere between 4.6 and 4.8. So we had very positive feedback, but we also got feedback about how we might um, make some changes to our, our, our videos. So the benefits of consultation is that you really do create a very comprehensive and a very realistic scenario that, that is relevant to the experiences of learners in the environment. All of the decision points were really um, relevant to not just the learners, but the faculty and to academics who are using this in uh, practice to orient students, uh, orient new hires into the environment. Um, it's also, we were able to, because we were such an interprofessional team and we brought in interprofessionals to consult with us, it became very relevant to the work of interprofessional groups. And we also generated some interest in, in, in the steps of dissemination by uh, having faculty and educators be part of the focus group. They are looking for this to use it in the future. And I think it really created another opportunity for interprofessional collaboration, not just in practice, but now in creating these types of innovative learning objects. Um, Lessons learned in production. So I'm going to share our lessons learned, but turn it over to Wendy, who will share this, this information. Yeah, thank you so much, Paula. And just um, for everyone's benefit, we are on target with our times. So we have a few minutes to get through and we'll have enough time for questions at the end. So thank you so much. So Paula, the only thing I would add to that as well as part of this virtual gaming simulation, we embedded the principles of interprofessional practice and collaboration. We actually move the learners through that experience as well and debriefing and how to give critical feedback. So it is a, cre um, a really interesting um, and unique um, engagement strategy also for the learner to really facilitate that interprofessional practice lens. So what did we learn? Well, as Paul has indicated, consultation and feedback is critical. That iterative process and it's an integrated process is absolutely a must. For version control of the scripts, because as you can imagine, through that feedback and utilizing the feedback, there were many iterations, and we really needed to use a centralized process for shared drives or shared tools so we could work collaboratively to adjust, keep up to date with all the different versions. So that's highly recommended if you're thinking about um, carrying out this type of work. Meetings and script rehearsals can be done virtually. It was very successful. It was a very collaborative atmosphere, so it does work. Um, one thing that was really important that we have reflected upon is that we left some of the integrated trademarked tools to the end, um, seeking permissions for their use. So if you're thinking about integrating tools that are evidence-based and have some authorship, it's very important to engage 
obviously um, the owners of those tools early on to ensure that they're okay with the integration without um, within the VGS. It truly was, as Paula said, and that I can attest to an interprofessional collaborative experience, really promote that. I think that's such a critical learning and one of the very positive aspects of this experience. And of course, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about the financial implications. As you can imagine, working with numerous teams across institutions with many layers of different types of financial approvals to get through in institutions, engaging in that process and having one point person early on in the process is critical to ensure that things go smoothly and the transfers happen in a reasonable time so we're not left scrambling at the end. So we really did learn from that process. And Paula, at this time, I think we have about three to four minutes left before we turn it over for questions. So why don't you walk us through a little, little bit around the use of 360 video and what we learned from that experience. So this was the first time we tried using hotspots, 360 photos and video. We think that the 360 photos and hotspots were viewed very, very positively by our focus group and our players and our usability work. Um, one of the things we've realized is that our 360 video is not as clear and sharp as, as our other videos. So, um, and if we have time at the very, very end, I will show you a little clip of how we use the 360. Um, but you need a different mindset when you're using 360 video. And that means that you're not sitting in front of the stage and watching the scenario as you did in the clips that I showed you. Even if you're really close up, it was all happening in front of you. When you're using the 360 video, you've got to design a script and the action so that you as the player or the player is in the middle of the stage and things are happening all around. And I think we could do a better job at that. And we have received another grant to create another uh, simulation game. So we are going to use those lessons learned in the new um, video. And um, it's one of the possibilities here is to use 360, if any of you are thinking of using it, to film from the patient's perspective or the client's perspective, because then that client would be able to look around and see everything that the the um, healthcare team is doing and be able to, the learner could get a sense of what it means to be a client in such a vulnerable condition or situation. So that's, those are our lessons learned there. And now we're open to any questions. Uh, I believe they put a link to this game. It, it will take you about an hour to go through it. It's very long. It became very epic, the storyline. Uh, and we role modeled uh, the best we could what interprofessional practice is like in this kind of a situation. So I'll stop sharing. Great. Thank you so much to Paula and Wendy for that great introduction to the 360 uh, simulation video what's wrong with Simon. Um, if you want, so we do have questions in the Q&A, which I can read out, but if you like Paula, you can set up your quick demo, because I think it wouldn't hurt to see another quick uh, demo of the 360. That's generally the best part about the presentation with 360. So I'll go ahead and read the question while you're setting that up. Um, so the first question we have is, um, what is the cost of using VGS 360? I have seen some companies use this platform to create the game for you, but they are expensive. I just want to know what is the cost of the platform to be used by ourselves? So if we use it by ourselves. So I'll answer that. We, we uh, part of our eCampus grant allowed us to partner with a Canadian. It wanted us to an Ontario partner. So Affinity Learning has what's called a community and in that community, it is free and it's self-authoring. So if you went to their community and signed up, became a member, it doesn't cost anything. Uh, you can actually create, you can self-author and they have a tutorial on how to do it. It's basically, you, you pick things up, it's like Legos. You pick things up, you put them on the master screen and create the flow and where you want to you know, put in text, you type in the text and where you want to put in a video, you put a, a URL link to your video. The easiest way to do it yourself is to, um, well, we used a Vimeo account. So all of our videos were done by us. 
All of the development was done by us, by our own technologists. I myself have a very rudimentarily, even though I'm a nurse, I kind of know how to move things around in Affinity so it's easy to learn. And there are a few other platforms. If you belong to a college or university in Ontario, through eCampus Ontario, you can actually get an account to H5P. So both the Affinity that we use, the community site, and the H5P, which is membership based, and there's free, but you get more features if you go through eCampus to sign up. You, you actually can do this on your own and both platforms are very similar, uh, but we wanted to do this with an uh, Ontario provider. So we went with Affinity Learning. And, and Paula, uh, sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to, sorry, I interrupted you there. I was going That's to okay. I was just um, going to say- has been excellent at posting all of the links to Affinity Learning and also to H5P. So maybe when you're bringing up that clip so we could show them what we were referring to around the quality of the 360 video, um, I can maybe try to look at some of these questions, but perhaps could you clarify the questions that are posted? Do we have an opportunity that we could answer those questions at a later date and get to the appropriate persons? How does that work? I believe so. So what I can do is we can try to capture the names of the persons. And if you're comfortable sharing your email address in the chat, we also encourage that. So then if we don't get to any of the answers, you can do so. And I believe you could also type the answer as well as uh, we'll, uh, Paula is demonstrating another quick demo. So if yes. you want, you can read. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I will say, yes, we are AODA compliant. It, when you go into the game, it, it explains it and you can turn on closed captioning um, and other features. So we are, a, it, it, Affinity Learning is, provides AODA compliance as well. Okay, so um, I'm, going to, I'm going to run, I'm going to do another share screen. Here we go, so we're back to and share audio, okay. Are you seeing the screen? Yes, Paula, it's good. Okay, okay so, so this is just uh, going to the one? end of uh -huh. this video. All right, uh, two liters. Sorry. Okay, I'm just gonna fast forward. So now we're going into the 360 environment and you'll yes, see the difference in the quality of the video. Yeah, you know, he's still so saying, here we have the physician, the team on, leader, on the and an RT leaders, and the mother. To, uh, a mask? Yes, and please you can start see him on look around the, the mask room. with filter. Okay, got it. So uh, video quality me, is something we want to practice you. with. The well, actual player is despite of starting computer, him on computer, they're going to be so doing like the to start him on some medication. Any allergies? But again, you can see there's nothing to see when you look around the room. So we're going to do a better job uh, uh, at would that have his putting the camera much closer Perhaps, or putting no the camera where the no, child no, is and none. having the child okay. view Heather, what is can going I on. Get for Simon so that just gives you an MDI, example. Eight puffs every 15. Okay, so I'll stop sharing. There's, and, and in it, you're actually seeing the closed loop of communications and other things that make the team work, role models how the team works well together. Okay, so That's, Paula, um, yes. I have confirmed with Rama that we can capture the questions and we will share our email addresses to ensure that we respond and get back to folks around the questions that they've asked, because it looks like we're probably near the end of our time. And although we'd love to be able to answer all those questions, I'm very respectful of the time and everyone needs yeah. to get and, into other and, things. Yeah. And we have also put uh, a link to my email. Wendy can add hers, but it's. I think at this point, it's easier to get a hold of me. Uh, if you have any questions at the very beginning, when I introduce myself, I put my email in. You're welcome to contact me with any questions and uh, anything you have about the about it. And uh, our actors were all members of our team, our actual team, except for the child and the the mother, who are mother and son. Uh, they were real actors. The rest of us are the script writing core team members. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Wendy and Paula, once again, for that great presentation. I think the you know, amazing, great questions we're receiving is an testament to really how well this was put together and the interest in, you know, simulation overall. So people really want to know how you did it and how you did it so well. So we'll go ahead and capture those questions and um, we'll send them to you. And I guess for those who are 
anonymous attendee. So, and I see some have clarified who they are. So we'll go ahead and capture that. So for, I'll turn it over to Rich for our next presentation, who we will give some extra time as well, just because, you know, we had a late startup. So over to you, Rich. That's awesome. Well, that was really immersive. You're kind of like right there with all the audio and video effects too. Um, <clears throat> so uh, our next presenter, we have uh, Svetanka, and she is from York University and um, is going to show us um, the um, VR house fire sim simulation, which is, um, uh, is going to focus on the uh, uh, pedagogical role of VR experiments in a course on the economics of insurance and decision-making under risk. Um, super interesting to see all these high-risk scenarios using VR. Uh, so, uh, uh, Svetanka, over to you. Thank you very much for the introduction, Erich. Thank you everyone for joining uh, our session today. I first would like to make sure that you can all hear me. Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. And now can you see my PowerPoints? Yes, they look great. Okay, so I'm good to go. Thank you. Um, so I'll start by providing some context for the project that we implemented with the support of VOS grant from eCampus Ontario. I'll motivate uh, the use of VR simulations for the course we designed and describe its implementation. Unfortunately, I cannot offer a demonstration of the VR house fire simulation because you would need special uh, hardware, special equipment for that, but I'm going to show a video recording of a user experience with the simulation. In lieu of a conclusion, I'll look into some of the costs and benefits of using VR simulations in the classroom. The project was implemented collaboratively by an interdisciplinary and interinstitutional team at York and Western universities. Two of us on the core team are economists and two of us are mathematicians. The project would not have been feasible without the invaluable support of our research assistants, a project manager, an editor. And last but not least, I would like to give a shout out to our uh, industry partner, XPAN, who helped us develop the virtual reality house fire simulation. Now, all of us in the core team have a long-standing collaboration under the umbrella of the Risk and Insurance Studies Center at York. Risk is a research hub that pursues a holistic and interdisciplinary approach to the field of insurance and related disciplines. But RISC is also a center for innovative teaching and engaging students with the fields of risk management and uh, insurance. So what were our project objectives? We wanted to design and develop an online course on the economics of insurance and decision-making under risk alongside the VR experiment, which we'll hope will turn into a whole-blown virtual reality behavioral lab in the future. We want to offer an introductory level treatment of highly technical material to our students. On one hand, we want to offer a solid foundation of modern economic theory, but on the other hand, we also want to incorporate behavioral insights to decision-making about risk and insurance into our course. And here, just to give you a glimpse about what I'm talking about, economists like to assume that individuals are rational when making decisions. That means that we make decisions without making any errors. We always make the correct decisions. But empirical evidence suggests that we have cognitive limitations. And in the last couple of decades, uh, developments in cognitive psychology have uh, put the beginning of a new subfield in economics 
behavioral economics, which explicitly accounts for this uh, cognitive limitations in decision making. So we wanted students to have a glimpse at both at the traditional paradigm in economics and at more recent developments um, in the field of behavioral economics. We also want to, want to offer our students hands-on applications of the topics which we cover in the course and the topics that we cover, uh, uh, some of the topics that we cover are risk, risk aversion, conventional and behavioral theories of insurance demand and insurance and economic development. Um, they two deliverables under our project, uh, course materials and the VR house fire simulation, which is the highlight of this project. In terms of course materials, for each topic, we provide the conventional materials uh, in economics, which are lecture notes, PowerPoints, practice exercises, and interactive activities, uh, such as uh, practice quizzes and uh, case studies. But the great output I feel uh, from this project, which I would like to hi highlight here, is the standalone, self-contained, so-called one-stop shop pressbooks modules for each topic which integrate this, uh, all the components that we typically provide to students. Uh, the pressbook modules integrate lecture notes with animated graphs and H5P interactive components that students can access on a click from any device. On the left side of your screen, you see the cover page of um, the first uh, module. All the course materials that we created are available for free download from e -campus, from the eCampus Ontario library with the Creative Commons license, and they can be adopted or adapted by any instructor for their own purposes. To experience the house fire simulation, you need the MetaQuest 2 hardware that you see on the picture. You need the VR headset and you need the hand controllers. Once you put the VR headset on your head, you are uh, transported into a different reality. Um, VR is a highly immersive and interactive environment for hands-on learning. Um, as the demonstration of Wendy and Paula shows, it is widely used in health sciences and other disciplines but it's not so commonly used for instruction in economics. As we knew that we would be able to develop only one virtual reality simulation, we wanted to find the pedagogical justification for its use in the context of our course. And we thought it was particularly relevant to illuminate the relevance of um, behavioral drivers of the decision making under uh, risk and uncertainty. Now, when faced with an uncertain outcome, our likelihood of experiencing a loss and our risk tolerance are two of the, the major determinants of our decision making. The problem is that uh, um, our probability of experiencing a loss and our risk attitude or risk aversion are not observable. When we are faced with a problem like that in economics, we use choice experiments in order um, to elicit um, individuals' preferences or valuations. Choice experiments are simply a set of survey questions based on hypothetical situations that we administer. Choice experiments are used, for example, to elicit the willingness to pay for a new product. You can use it to elicit the willingness to pay for insurance. They're also widely used by policymakers to elicit our willingness to pay for public goods, such as, say, environmental goods, clean air. Um, and th these valuations are uh, embedded in public policy. 
the issue with choice experiments is that they can be sensitive to our cognitive constraints. So often we uh, have hypothetical bias when we use choice experiments. Hypothetical bias uh, arises um, precisely because as individuals, we are faced with a hypothetical as opposed to a real life situation. And uh, given our cognitive constraints, we do not uh, truthfully represent our preferences. So um, several considerations went into the design of the experiment. We wanted this immersive environment um, to illustrate to our students how we can elicit something which is not observable in economics. We wanted to show them how we can elicit the willingness to pay for insurance. We also wanted to demonstrate to our students how sensitive our decision-making can be to our cognitive constraints. And finally, we also want to use that experiment to motivate the introduction of behavioral models of insurance pricing, excuse me, into the classroom. Now, another issue with the subject matter that we teach is that it is highly technical and students do not naturally connect with it. Undergraduate students have limited first-hand experience buying insurance, and we wanted this virtual reality simulation uh, to demonstrate to them the importance of insurance as a risk management tool. And just in passing, in the classroom, we use the experiment in conjunction with the pre post and uh, 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 with the pre and post simulation surveys. Now, once again, because we could develop only one experiment on, under the project, we were very careful choosing the risk. We chose home fires because home fires is one of the most common emergencies experienced by Canadians. Uh, home fires are devastating to those who experience it. At the same time, uh, house fires, residential fires, um, very costly for the economy. For example, a study by the Sunnybrook Health Science Center shows that life shortened or lost in house fires cost the Canadian economy uh, close to $8 billion over a 14-year period. The major cause of uh, house fires is cooking mishaps. Um, we were also working on that experiment during the pandemic. And you know that during the pandemic, most of us spent more time at home, but the more time we spent at home, the more we cook, and the more we cook, the more we are prone to accidents. So um, uh, deaths, uh, fire deaths in Ontario spiked during the pandemic. So we thought that this particular risk is particularly relevant. And the, the last thing I want to mention here is that um, house fires are also a very broad topic. We thought that the experiment that we, can des uh, that we designed could be easily adapted by other uh, instructors for the specific uh, context. Now, compa insurance um, is included typically in our home insurance policy. The coverage pays to repair or replace your home and damaged belongings in the event of a fire. In contrast to a car liability insurance, the purchase of fire insurance is not mandated by law which was important to us uh, from instructional standpoint. So before any further ado, please have a look at uh, your Zoom screen. I'm going to show you uh, the video recording of uh, a user experience with the VR house fire simulation.
The executable file can be downloaded from the Campus Ontario library. And soon, we hope um, the simulation will be available for free download from the Oculus uh, Store. So what are the costs and benefits from using virtual reality in the classroom? Virtual reality experiments are highly immersive realistic and engaging, in engaging. Research suggests that students find learning in the virtual reality uh, more stimulating compared to traditional instruction. Um, it is also a realistic but, but very safe environment for the acquisition of uh, complex skills and knowledge, um, you know, not per perhaps in the context that we use the experiment, but when I think of the context in which Wendy and Paula use uh, this type of simulations, you have a very small margin of error in real life. So you better practice uh, the necessary skills to uh, limit or eliminate altogether human error. So a very safe environment for that. One question perhaps that one can have as, um, as an instructor is whether the knowledge and skills learned in a virtual environment are transferable to real life. And uh, empirical evidence research suggests that indeed this is the case. Um, as an instructor, I also like the fact that uh, uh, virtual reality stimulates long-term knowledge retention. These are some of the pros uh, that um, uh, you can find in virtual reality experiments. Clearly, they're more, more than that. What are uh, the cons of using virtual reality? As you pointed out uh, in the questions that you asked uh, the previous presenters, the technology is costly. On the upside, I feel that many universities in Ontario are currently investing in uh, the uh, capacity of uh, having virtual reality um, experiments on campus uh, for the use of different uh, stakeholders and for different purposes. Um, the learning curve, if you want to design your own virtual reality simulation, the learning curve is very steep. I wouldn't advise you unless you, are, uh, you have coding, um, coding skills, really. It is uh, pretty complex uh, to develop uh, such an experiment. And even though nowadays they're a little bit more user-friendly platforms, 
um, if you put again a cost benefit analysis, probably you have a better use for your time. We also shouldn't forget that uh, the learning curve can be steep for students as well. We think that perhaps they're familiar with the virtual reality games. So this is a natural way to reach out to them and bring to them important concepts, important materials in a framework, in an environment they're familiar with. But more often than not, I find that we overestimate um, the technical capabilities for productive uses in the classroom. So students can have a steep learning curve as well. And one concern that we should be aware of as educators is that the devices that they use for virtual reality experiment are still pretty clunky, uh, pretty uncomfortable. So they can be difficult to handle for students with uh, disabilities. Thank you very much. Any comments, feedback? Thank you, Svetlanka. That was excellent. Uh, I'm all for it. I wish I could go back and take an economics course that would have a VR device as part of the required materials on the syllabus. Thank you. And by <laughs> the way, it's a field perhaps that we tend to, to think that it is very dry, but it is also a field that is very well paid. It is a great career choice for our students. And they will have many openings actually for new hires in the coming years. So we sincerely hope that students would uh, appreciate the course when we offer it. Thank you. That's great. So we have a couple of questions coming in and I'll just read them. Mm -hmm. um, so does the risk department provide VR equipment for students or is it a collaboration with another department? Uh, so the two possibilities currently at York to use VR equipment, the risk center is acquiring its own equipment and thanks to uh, this grant from eCampus Ontario and the government of Ontario, we did purchase a few uh, sets for our virtual reality lab. At York also, they're building kind of special labs. Um, you can borrow uh, uh, headsets, uh, the Oculus uh, set from the library at York. It's still not a mainstream technology, but the university I feel is building the capacity for that. But there is for sure, yes, we want to have that lab. That's great. Um, okay, another question. So is there a specific VR headset for compatibility with this, um, with this resource? And if so, how did you choose um, which one to go with? Oh, that was, that's a good question. So we wouldn't be able to answer uh, the technical question, but if you provide me with your name and I'll, uh, type in my email in the uh, chat room so you can connect with me and I'll make sure to answer that question. Um, I, I don't know whether the experiment that you see can be used with a different uh, technology. Uh, for us, a lot of research went into the platform that we should use for development and it seems that currently Unity perhaps is uh, the mainstay for this type of experiments. Uh, Unity is a development platform for 3D, 2D, VR uh, simulations, but unfortunately it is uh, expensive. Um, I know that there's some uh, creative, uh, there's some open uh, software that you can use. Once again, I can check for that if you connect with me and provide you with links. Um, and uh, the Oculus 2 uh, set that you see pretty much is becoming a leader in the market. So the uh, I, I don't know whether all the products that you see there, they offer basically a great store. They have different games that you can download and you can also download this virtual experiment uh, from there. Um, but um, I don't know whether all the games that they have uh, executed specifically in Unity, but they're beca becoming a leader in the field. That's awesome. That's great. One of the other questions um, that we got, actually, you've you've partially answered. So I'll just I'll still read it out loud to see if there's anything else you'd like to say. So how did you go about finding the right development partner? 
Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> now, again, I have to thank e Campus Ontario. We explored different options. Now, we also have to keep in mind that for this project, we had very limited time. So one possibility for you, if you'd like to put together an experiment like that, is to look into perhaps the engineering department and hire a research assistant. Now, it turns out that the research assistants uh, who have engineering background are pretty expensive, uh, more expensive than, say, economic students to hire. Um, and also, if you hire students, you have to budget for a longer period of time to develop this experiment. Now, what we know from research that we did, it takes on average about, uh, about uh, three months, perhaps one term, to develop this experiment for perhaps a group, a, a small team of uh, graduate engineering students. So that's the reason why we started look, looking for an industry partner and um, the directory that the campus uh, was creating helped a lot. That's how we identified our industry partner, Expand. And we, we're really happy with uh, the collaboration and what we could come up with uh, together in a very short period of time. Amazing, that's so great to hear. Uh, we will, of course, um, connect and get uh, uh, the emails uh, for, for these questions so that we can do a follow up uh, after the session as well. So th thank you very much for uh, leading us through your project. And I think in both of the presentations, for me, it was really interesting to have the opportunity to um, uh, see the product or the resource itself, but also hear about the development process and what that was like. I, I, I think that part of it uh, really is great to share back to the community so that other people who are thinking about embarking on their own VR journey can start to put some of those pieces together from, from, uh, from what you've shared. So we really appreciate you coming and sharing with us today. And thank you everyone for joining. I, I'll post my email in the chat room if there are any further questions. Thank you, over to you. All right, thank you for that amazing presentation to both uh, uh, Svetlanka and Rich as well. And I couldn't have said it better myself as I start learning more about simulation, VR, XR, and looking at equipment. Um, this was a great introduction into sort of the background of what really goes into putting together your own VR or simulation. Um, so for at this time, Rich and I are going to give our closing remarks uh, for the uh, week. So we, so I just want to start by saying what a wonderful and insightful week it has been. We hope you've had the opportunity to attend the different events throughout the week, starting with the welcome and demonstration sessions on Monday to the asynchronous guided activities that we had posted on both Tuesday and Thursday, and the many wonderful resources that were showcased on uh, both Wednesday and today uh, earlier this morning, and of course, our two uh, previous one. So so thank you to everyone who has helped put together this open house event. A special thanks from those who have expressed interest in presenting. We had a lot and a short time of window, but we thank you for your enthusiasm, interest, and just you know excitement and ownership over what you've put together for this project. We especially want to thank those who showcased their projects this week. So uh, thanks again to all of our presenters. We thank you for your time, energy, and excitement, again, for your project and to your colleagues as well, for those who were able to attend those sessions. A special thanks to our planning committee for this event, from our open library teams to our communication teams and our amazing moderators as well. This event would not have been possible without your expertise and dedication into making this event work. Amazing. Um, thank you. I, I echo everything that Rama said. It's been such a fun week and it's been so exciting to have so many different people involved. Uh, I was thinking back to our first session on Monday, Rama. That was your session where we got uh, the kickoff and the demonstration. You took us through the fresh new 
interface. Uh, it, it looks beautiful. It's aligned to the you know, eCampus latest branding guidelines and uh, has so many um, uh, new ways to access the resources. We got to see how there's both an open library and a VLS collections interface. So if an individual wants to, you know, just tackle all of the open library resources, uh, but still know which one came from out of the VLS collection, there's new little icon that that denotes that. And then of course, if somebody wants to just uh, look at just the VLS collection through that interface, they'll be able to easily access resources there. And I think it was in that session that we really highlighted that there were more than 600 new items are in progress being added. Uh, so there's so many more open resources for Ontario, Ontario educators and their students. Uh, it's, it's explosive growth. Uh, it's almost mind boggling when you think about how the eCampus Ontario Open Library, even before the VLS collection has already saved Ontario students millions of dollars. Like it's, it's hard to tell and I'm so excited to watch it grow going forward. Just what that impact or the echo of all of these new resources is going to be for uh, educators and students in Ontario. Thank you for that, uh, Rich. <laughs> I couldn't have said it better myself, especially as one of those busy, one of those folks busy cataloging. It is extremely exciting to get a preview of all of those I know amazing resources uh, to be coming out short, uh, to be coming out soon. So I want to ask you, Rich, uh, parlez-vous français? Moi, je parle un peu. No. And with that little French I speak, I had the pleasure of attending the Francophone session on Wednesday morning. I didn't need to understand everything to know what was being said, um, to know to I didn't know, I didn't need to know everything that was being said to be amazed by the two resources and its value to the Ontario post-secondary Francophone community. And this was a huge um, uh, contribution and achievement and the Francophone resources that we have um, about to be cataloged is truly going to make in a, a mark on the post-secondary Francophone OER community. We saw uh, Récit de vie et Récit de fiction, l'autobiographie, la biographie et le conte, which aims at filling the lack of resources adapted to digital technology for teaching French. And we also saw a Moodle plugin, uh, Moodle plugin uh, which is titled Virtual Assistant Pedagogy en ligne pour planifier Finerive et publier vous pour en ligne dans Moodle, developed to help teachers plan, design, script, and publish online courses in on Moodle. So if you if you know me and have seen me presenting before, then you know I have most definitely been working on my French as called out by our Francophone community. So it is my pleasure to always attend to speak French whenever possible. Good for you. You're further along than me on that journey. Uh, I congratulate you. I, uh, Wednesday in the afternoon, I joined the um, Creating Open Education Resources session, and that was the one where we got to see a little bit more about some specific resources, the value they're providing to the community, and also how they were built. So we were walked through the HyFlex Open Textbook uh, collaboration. Um, via a panel chat. And then we also got to take a look at the expanding institutional accessibility through uh, Niagara College's Accessibility Hub. And we got to hear short stories about experiences developing and using OERs. So what stood out to me from that session was um, how big and complex a single resource project can be. So any one of the 600 items that was developed in collaboration with set several partners, some of those projects stand out as significantly large teams in investing thousands and thousands of hours of time over 2021. So across 600 or more projects, you begin to realize how busy the post-secondary sector was during the pandemic on top of adapting to remote delivery and experimenting with innovative technologies. It's really mind boggling. So I think that session taught me that as a community, we really took a ginormous leap forward in high quality digital transformation. And it was through a lot of hard work from this, this community and, and, and everybody who's been involved in even just one of those projects should really be applauded for their contributions. Well said, I completely echo all of that uh, you just said. 
And this morning um, was, was definitely a session that stood up for me. So uh, during the Indigenous and Diverse Content Showcase, we learned how these two meaningful and impactful diverse contents were created and its intended use. So we started with the introduction to the Black Experiences in Canada, a five unit course aimed at providing students with the opportunity to engage in a variety of content that centers on Black experiences in Canada through analysis of various art forms, including literature, poetry, music, and theory. That course most definitely had me at the mention of poetry um, as one of my passions. Uh, this was also followed by learning about using the principles of a good mind of good mind in indigenous research and the overall OER development process for Six Nations Polytechnic First OER, exploring indigenous foods and food sovereignty, an exam of food, uh, food sovereignty and food experiences in Haudenosaunee communities. Both of these um, research really stood out for me just of the personal a personal experience and insightful and what it really meant to both of these creators who put together these resources and to share with the larger uh, Ontario post-secondary community at large and its intended use. So I implore everyone, if you get the opportunity to really take a look at these two resources and, and see how you can incorporate it into your uh, teaching and even you know outside of the teaching, uh, outside of the class, uh, classroom. Uh, one of the resources, the Indigenous uh, Foods and Food Sovereignty has a recipe for a three sister soup, which I most definitely will be trying out this weekend and really just getting you to think about your connection with food and your experience with food and what it really means you know, to have food sovereignty and not have food sovereignty. Great idea. I think I need to uh, do the same thing this weekend, Rama. So I'm going to borrow that idea from you. Um, that took us back to today. Uh, we were uh, just in the extended reality uh, content session. I already said it once, I'm going to say it again. How do I go back to school to take an economics course that requires a VR headset? I think that is just the coolest thing that we're at this moment in time. Um, we also got to see the uh, acute pediatric virtual uh, game-based simulation. And th this session really just sort of reminded me of like, wow, like what important high stakes content areas are out there. And also now they're open educational resources that other people can access and use in different classrooms across the province. Uh, they're supporting critical thinking and uh, they're providing true uh, true to life experiences. I took that quote from one of the pre uh, presenters today, but true to life experiences. That's exactly what it is. Um, it was neat for me too, that we got to hear an example of one of the projects using our H5P member benefit to support development. I love to uh, hear those connections in, in real life being made. So that was awesome too. Um, we all got to learn from these sessions too, a little more about what goes into developing a resource like this. So I hope that, you know, everybody saw the same, same value as me as, you know, it being an opportunity to take some early learnings and uh, take that new, that new knowledge into a potential new VR uh, resource, which, you know, might just be the, the, the start of uh, more growth and more VR resources hitting the open library. Well said. And I think what stood out for me as well with this um, two VRs is, is the audio. There's really something resonating, realistic about those uh, both audios, especially if you've ever been in a hospital before or if you've ever encountered a fire situation, just hearing that alarm, both type of alarm and how real they sounded and how I don't know if you were me, you got nervous <laughs> about the outcome. To me, that is a true example of a great uh, simulation VR XR, but a true great emerged experience um, in a learning environment. And with that, I want to turn over to our sort of um, engagement on social media. So I don't know about you, Rich, but I feel like I have been very engaged um, more than ever on social media this week because of all of the activities going on. Um, a shout out to all who have been participating on Twitter and LinkedIn, sharing their resources and sharing about their experience using the new open library catalog and search filter. 
Um, I want to give a special shout out to someone I noticed on Twitter who I saw just did an incredible job. Uh, it's Irene Stewart at St. Clair College, who documented her experience on Twitter and discovered hitting OER gems in her process. So if you're on Twitter, if you have a chance, please check out her story and her tweet because it's going to make you laugh. It's going to make you pause and just go, oh, that's pretty cool. I didn't know that was in the open library or, oh, wow, I can't wait to check out this hitting gem from VLS. What was, what stood out to you, Rich? <laughs> it was so cool. It was like a whole other, like week long asynchronous conference happening, um, uh, beyond just these sessions. Uh, there was a, there was a resource that, uh, that I saw shared that I thought was, um, you know, really important, timely, and, you know, is, is a good resource that's going to sort of help everybody set up to be more successful in a, in, in their digital transformation. And that was the McMaster University um, uh, shared the engaging the online learning strategies for meaningful and effective learning experiences. Um, and also inside of this resource, um, there was a chapter on uh, workplace integrated learning and sustaining student engagement with strategies for getting the most out of work integrated learning. So that is another really important topic. And uh, that resource outlines some, um, some, you know, food for thought in terms of how to set up the time in the classroom to be uh, maximizing the outcomes from the time in the uh, work integrated learning environment. So Again, a resource that I think just sort of shares the learning forward so that more and more educators can tap in and do more and more things on their digital transformation journey. Thank you. And with that, uh, once again, we want to say thank you to our presenters, those who were working behind the scene to put all of this incredible event together, those who you know were able to attend all the session and take part in the asynchronous activity. Um, we will be posting the videos uh, within the coming weeks and then we'll make an announcement on Twitter once those are available for viewing. So thank you and we hope you had a great week um, you know, becoming familiar with the VLS asset and we hope you continue to check the open library for more resources to be added. As Rich mentioned, we have 600 plus in total. So there's still more to come and we are very excited to, um, to highlight them as they become available. Okay, so thank you everyone. And thank you, Rama, for all of the work that you always do on the open library. And, and uh, you know, everybody can trust me when they say it has just ramped up. Things have gotten really busy in your world. You make it look easy. So thank you. All right, bye everyone.